Hey, Econ 200, welcome back. I'm not sure what you're doing with your spring break, but what I'm doing with my spring break is making YouTube videos for you. I hope you enjoy them. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit different approach on Chapter uh, 8 than I did in Chapter 6. On Chapter 8, what I'm planning to do is cut up the material into more segments than I did with Chapter 6. With Chapter 6, I basically did two videos. Each of them were fairly long. For this chapter, I'm going to try to cut the videos up uh, into smaller bite-sized portions for you. So hopefully they'll be easier to watch and also a little more targeted. If there's a particular topic that you need help with, you can go just directly to that video and watch it. So let's begin. Remember that what we're talking about in Chapter 8 is price controls, price ceilings, and price floors. This video and this uh, series of videos is going to start by talking about price ceilings. That is a maximum price, a, le a legislated or legal maximum price above which buyers and sellers are not allowed to trade. Okay, So the first thing to uh, think about when we're talking about price ceilings is how does that interact with our typical supply demand graph. Remember that under ordinary circumstances, if no one was controlling the price, we would expect the market to end up here. Uh, at the intersection of supply and demand, right? That's going to be a price at which all of the units that buyers want to buy are going to be offered for sale by sellers, okay? Now, what happens when you have a price ceiling is that the government says this equilibrium price is too high. For whatever reason, we want the price to be lower than that. And so they're going to legislate some price that falls below equilibrium. I'm going to make it a fairly uh, significant price ceiling, put it well below the equilibrium, okay, and we're going to call that price P bar. And no buyer is allowed to pay a price higher than P bar, no seller is legally allowed uh, to charge a price that is higher than P bar. What's going to happen in this case? Well, notice that where P bar hits the supply curve, that's going to give us the quantity of units supplied by the sellers. And where P bar hits the demand curve, that tells us the quantity of units that will be demanded by the buyers. And notice that we're not in a case of equilibrium anymore. Uh, now the buyers want to buy a lot more units than the sellers do. Why? Well, because the price is so low, that's an attractive price to a lot of buyers. In equilibrium, these buyers here wouldn't have been willing to pay that price and they would have just voluntarily not made purchases. Uh, in equilibrium, this price would have been more attractive to the sellers, and the sellers would have been willing to produce more units. So what you get with a price ceiling is a shortage. Okay, that's the first effect of a price ceiling. And there are a number of, of effects that follow from that, but it's important for you to note that it's the shortages that are driving everything. All of the other results that we talk about are happening because the buyers are trying to compete with each other to buy up the, the scarce number of units that are available, but they're not allowed to compete with each other by raising the price, okay? And so instead of raising the price, a number of other things are going to happen instead. The first of those I'm going to talk about in this video, and then I'll, uh, I'll finish this video and move on to, uh, to the next one. The first effect of a shortage is going to be reductions in quality. Okay. Remember that the seller's goal is going to be maximizing their own profit. Right? That's what they want to do. And they can't maximize their profit by raising prices. The law is restricting them from, uh, from doing that. So what can you do instead? Well, if you can't raise price, something you might be able to do instead is cut your costs. And one way of cutting costs is by reducing the quality of the good that you're selling. So, for example, you could, if you're selling alcohol, let's say you're selling, uh, you know, fine whiskey, one thing that you could do is dilute your whiskey by, uh, you know, watering it down or maybe taking some rubbing alcohol or some other lower quality alcohol and putting that, mixing that in with your high quality whiskey. So you bring the value of your product down, but now you can sell this diluted product 
at the uh, legislated price, right? At that, uh, that ceiling price. And so that is going to increase your profit uh, as a seller. You might also, if you were um, a, a landlord of a building, you might cut your cost by deferring maintenance on the, the buildings. When the elevator breaks down, you don't fix it right away. When there's broken glass, uh, you know, a, a broken window, you don't replace that right away. When the, um, uh, the smoke detectors, when they uh, go bad, you don't replace them right away either. These are little ways where uh, a landlord can cut costs because he's not allowed to raise prices uh, and so he can, uh, he can try to increase his profit in other ways. By the way, if you've ever heard the term slumlord before, a slumlord is somebody who uh, is a, a landlord, um, but all of his buildings are in poor condition, poorly maintained. He's usually not friendly to his, uh, to his, his tenants. Almost without exception, slumlords are running buildings that are price controlled. If they were allowed to raise their prices, then they would be wanting to, uh, or they would have a, a financial incentive to increase their price and sell a higher quality good to, or rent out a higher quality good to their tenants, okay? Uh, but they have no financial incentive to do that, and so we end up with um, you know, poorly maintained buildings. You can also, uh, reducing cost doesn't just mean you know, uh, reduce the value of the product, you can also cut services. So if you're running a restaurant, for example, and uh, there's now a, a maximum price that you can charge for your food, well, one way that you might cut costs is lay off some of your staff and uh, you, know, you don't have people that you're hiring to wait tables anymore or to bust the tables. Instead, you put that work onto your customers instead. All right, And so they pay this lower price, but they're also doing some of your work for you and you don't have to pay them for that. That's another way that you, uh, you might reduce your costs as a, uh, as a seller. Or you may shorten your hours of operation. Maybe you're running a, uh, a bank or a restaurant or whatever, and maybe ordinarily you'd be open for 12 hours a day or um, you know, in some cases maybe 16 hours a day or maybe even 24 hours a day in, in, uh, you know, in some market segments. But you might cut your hours and say, well, now we're only gonna be operating for eight hours a day or six hours a day, okay? Now, why can you get away with this when you are uh, a seller? I mean, you could say, well, hold on a second. If I'm cutting the value of my product, the quality of my product, or I'm cutting services, well, that's going to put me at a competitive disadvantage relative to my, uh, you know, the, the other firms in this market. And under ordinary circumstances in equilibrium, that would be true. But here's the, the, the issue, or here's what allows you to get away with that. You have a shortage of goods in this market. From the customer's perspective, that means there aren't enough goods to go around relative to how many they want to buy. But from the seller's perspective, a shortage of goods is a surplus of customers. I'm gonna write that down. A shortage of goods is a surplus of customers. Okay, so you're already you already have people knocking down your door trying to uh, to get everything that you're willing to sell, and so when you cut your cost by reducing the quality of your your good or cutting services that are associated with it, sure you're going to lose some customers. Some of this quantity demanded is going to shrink and shift to the left, but that's not a problem for you. You can still sell all you want to until that quantity demanded comes all the way down here to quantity supplied. So under conditions of price ceilings, there's plenty of room for the sellers to uh, cut the value of their costs and reduce services that are associated with their goods because they have this big surplus of consumers. All right, that's it for this segment. I'm gonna move on uh, to the next one where we talk about bribes and black markets.